ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see you again on our and during our second Zoom meeting that replaces our meeting at the Max Weber Lecture Hall, namely to do and to interact with uh, the person we invited for a forum evening. This time it is Yusra Aburabi. She comes from Morocco. She is our new fellow at the center. At a distance from Rabat, she is doing her very, very interesting work. As you can imagine, if you live in Morocco, if you become a scientist in Morocco, you have also a French-related, a France-related background. You studied first, if I see right, at Morocco and later on at Lyon and made your dissertation about Mar Morocco's African policy under the reign of Mohammed VI. So this is a first part, a first element of the education of Yusra Aburabu, Aburabi, who is a political scientist. You know very well that in order to have an access to law as culture, a lot of discipline, disciplines are implied among others also, and not uh, the least one, political science. How to conceive, how to do political science, to do it in the context of the French culture, that is a little bit different from the American and the Anglo-Saxon and the German tradition of political Wissenschaft, as for example, we cherish political science at the University of Bonn, there is a wide range to do political science, as you might know. There are some trends that go directly to political sociology. There are even trends to imply and to integrate culture into uh, such, a, uh, uh, such a paradigm of political science. And as far as I have understood by way of several discussions we had in Bonn and in Morocco, uh, Yusra uh, tries to embrace a lot of disciplines within and under the head of political science. And we will see that in our discussion today. And this is, I think, really very interesting. From her uh, interesting CV and really impressing CV, I would like to mention also that she is the organizer of a biannual conference about African climate change governance. So you see, it is also in exchange with others on the African continent that Yusra has developed her ideas. But it is also in her function of uh, being uh, the member of the political affairs cluster of the economic, social and cultural cluster of the African Union and a member of the academic board of the Global Campus on Human Rights and Interdisciplinary Center of excellent, supported by the European Union. That means you reach out, you are not just focused on North Africa or Africa as such, big enough, by the way, uh, if you want to be a specialist for everything in that region, uh, but uh, you are in close connection with France, with also with the international landscape in the United States, as I know. And since May 2020, uh, 20, you are a fellow at our center. And the specific construction of a digital fellowship that is a kind of invention due to the current crisis we live in and the only possibility we saw to integrate you in your work. And we are very keen and very interested to listen to your talk today. The talk is named The Normativities of Climate Change, Building New legal communities. So you can imagine that this is a really a huge thematic. It has to do with the fact to conceive climate change that is, first of all, we would say, a question for natural sciences, but not only for natural sciences because the humanities always said nature does not exist. It is only about constructions of nature that we talk in a radical epistemological um, perspective that some at least uh, cherished for uh, a longer while. 
Meanwhile, the climate change as one element of the ecological discourse has become so evident that only some deniers uh, in the United States of America, even uh, uh, if they are in the position of a president, uh, can really uh, deny such uh, an evolution we live in and the dramatic scenes uh, uh, that we are witnessing day by day. I am now, and this is the second topic that Yusra Abu Rabi has worked about during uh, the last weeks and month, is that they are counterbalanced by the crisis, by the corona crisis, because freezing sociality in so many respects must have, it, if the thesis of, of the Anthropocene is right, that is, uh, that means that the human being is behind all those changes as the main and impo most important the causal factor, then of course, the more sociality is shut down, the more there should be effects in climate, ecological systems, etc. And this is the message of a lot of greens, ecologically oriented people who say now, there is a little crisis, a certain corona crisis. It is a really, a li really little one, a tiny one, in comparison to the ecological crisis and the climate change that is going on and where the question is, what kind of means do we have? How much time do we have really to react, to wait, to observe, to construct, to theorize, etc. what we like to do? And we have done it for, for really a, a lot of time, how to construct according to the different disciplines in philosophy, musicology, in the arts, etc., etc., economy, political science, etc. So there is some urgency in the question. And of course, what kind of means are available and are able to be applied in order to really uh, find solutions for this problem, at, in, at least to make a halt to, 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 this, to this really dangerous and dramatic uh, evolution. I will not talk about the, the different means and the models uh, about public goods and economic approaches, political science approaches, uh, cultural science approaches as such. I would like to do that. But what is interesting, is there anything that makes nature build new kind of legal communities in the sense that for everyone, it is the global e effect as such is risk society had to do with the ecological crisis. Even the invention of this term had to be but with Beck and others had to do with this experience uh, of Chernobyl, for example, and others. And uh, this is continued. But the question is also, does nature create new legal communities? In what kind of sense? Who is implied? Political party systems, social movements, etc. And who are in such a way, in such a sense, the bearers not only of a new ecological consciousness, but who will be the actors and the actors to implement by way of rules and norms, normative orders, normative cultures, normativities in order to create Anthropocene normativities, as we call it, and who will be the bearers in order to build those legal communities that would support and would really bring such um, a, a drive into uh, the coordination of activities to preserve preserve the world. This is the dramatic scene we, we are in. And uh, what's the role of, 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 of law, environmental law does exist. Uh, of course, we know it's not completely new, but what is the role of, of legal communities in this? So that's my short introduction. Thank you very much for your attention. I think uh, we should now listen to the specialist who has worked about this in uh, different ways, and we would like to make the acquaintance of your propositions, solutions, perhaps discussions, critiques, etc. So uh, it's your turn now, dear Jutra. 
Thank you very much for this uh, amazing presentation. And uh, it's, it's really nice uh, to hear. It's actually more, uh, uh, my, uh, my background is more modest than it, it could like <laughs> reflect on your presentation, but, uh, but thank you. And thank you all for being here and uh, uh, paying attention to this uh, topic, which is indeed about climate change normativities. Uh, before I start, I would just like to, to add that I started looking on environmental issues, academically speaking, when I was working on my thesis on Morocco's African policy. And uh, I realized that Morocco had a very ambitious climate diplomacy, which was based in particular on the fact that it is in the midst of an energy transition. So in the space of a very few years, the construction of solar plants, uh, part, sorry, has made it possible to achieve uh, more than 30% of renewable energy in the, in the energy mix, which is, which is quite a lot compared to other European countries, for example. And, but at the same time, Morocco is lagging far behind in other areas of the environment, such as protection of forest, water, uh, reduction and sorting of waste, and so on which made me wonder like, what is behind the choice of a country in the, in the political and diplomatic areas that made him choose some of the environmental norms and integrate them. And in this case, in Morocco, I realized that it is not the people. People are not turning to be environmental friendly, such as in Europe, where you have this whole, you know, uh, like, uh, fashion about, you know, it's trendy to be ecologist and so on. And in Morocco, there, there's not such a, such a thing. So, which made me wonder about norms. So my, my project is not about Morocco, but it tries to bring this, you know, this local perspective on the matter. So I've been following the COPs and also since exactly I'm a member of the African Union Civil Society uh, group, uh, I've been following the, negotiations and the discussion within the African Union regarding how they should defend their interest in the, in the global regime of climate change negotiation. And it's very interesting to, to see that uh, actually they have, like most of the negotiators, they, they don't have a, a specific knowledge nor like a, a sort of, you know, uh, commitment into the ecological or the environmental issue. But it is the European who actually trained them to be specialists on how to negotiate on climate change, which is very interesting to, to see that. So um, my, my research project is not about that neither. It's not about negotiation. It's not a political, you know, analysis uh, project. It's more about normativities. But I come from those two, like, observation fields. So that's, that's where my, my research comes from. So um, the title is, is the normativities of climate change, uh, building new legal communities. So I will start by uh, defining what norms and normativities means in this project. And then I will talk about how I organize or I should organize my, my research. And then I will focus on the first part where, where I'm about, I'm, I'm working on that right now, which are the dominant normativities represented in global governance regime. And then I will share with you my partial conclusions that I had so far. And I will be very happy if you actually did comment on it or share also your ideas and critical about it. So uh, normativities and norms here refer to the sets of agreed and non-formal, but also sometimes formal and legal rules within a society. So they are based on beliefs, values, customs, habits, according to the Bourdieu scheme of social reproduction. And actually they could change from one culture to another, as well as within a culture or from a group to another, from an era to another and so on. So norms are negotiable. They're not given naturally, but they are invented socially. So they can be reproduced, they can be ignored, they can be contested, but in spite of this instability, it is possible to affirm that norms are a phenomenon that determines the, the behavior of individual in the same way, let's say that Emile Durkheim asserts that there are social facts that exerts a constraint on them. So normativity referred to a set of norms, the normative orders to which a society conforms. 
So a normativity does contain a power. And as Michel Foucault points out, the definition of what is normal or abnormal within a society is a result of a dynamic of power relation. So the power of standardization, though the establishment of, of norms, which is sometimes fo followed by the power of normation, which is the imposition of norms, is the result from both um, a constitution of the agent and the structure. So let me clarify this. Um, from a theory of international relation, constructive theory of international relation, and I refer here to Alexander Vance theory, our world is a social construction of reality, though the process of this construction of reality is co-constituted by both the individual and the society. So the individual affects how the society is and the society affects how the individual behave. So this interactive process of a social ideal nature leads to the emergence of normativities. So in my project, I have to look at both actually interaction and see how you know, uh, power relations emerge from that. So normativities are in motion as a result of this dynamic of power relations, which may be revealed uh, by normative tension. And a change in this course of history can give rise to new norms, which when challenged can give rise to other norms. And global climate change is particularly very illustrative of this dynamic. The current climate debate is part of the globalist and neoliberal normative debate on the ends of politics which calls to into question the capacity of the state to respond to environmental risks and challenges. And this theory, which emerged in the 80s, led to the construction of an epistemic community of both scientists and politicians. Thus, the creation of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, within the UN in 1988, uh, aimed and, uh, to give a normative meaning to environmental problems. So that's what COPs do every year. They gave us a normative meaning to environmental problems. And the main meaning given and generally accepted until now uh, is that humans in the era of the Anthropocene, and Anthropocene was an expression popularized by Paul Crudson, are in the, at the origin, and I will share with you all the materials later, are at the origin of the destruction of the environment which is at the root of climate disruption. So within this normativity of the Anthropocene, different perspective theories are being debated. For example, that of green capitalism, I'm sure you heard of it, responsible growth, eco-socialism, degrowth, and so on. And all these theories that are, again, prescriptive, participate in the construction of normative subsets embodied with different epistemic communities that are in conflict within each other. So the Anthropocene theory uh, contains all those, let's say, sub-theory, but it's also challenged by another, let's say, uh, big theory, which is described as climate septic. So the later, by challenging the norms that humans owe adapt to the nature, have created a new normative community. And this has also given rise to the new normative, also other new normative subsets, such as climate realists, climate diagnostician, uh, like when you say that you're really religious uh, agnostic, so climate agnosticians, or the, um, or the anti-ecologist, and so on. So all these norms are sometimes uh, you know, uh, used by people to argue, to assert certain facts. And in Morocco, for example, uh, some people are struggling to make progress using this, uh, this set of norms. In Europe, it is exactly the same thing. So uh, most of the time, uh, the politician use the economic uh, arguments because it is the most, uh, let's say, easy to, to convince with. And that's one of the things that I, I've noticed. Anyway, the environment is generally seen as a concern of the economically developed countries of the North, as opposed to the economically less developed countries of the South. 
So the analysis of climate change normativities reveal several nuances. This may be old pro-environmental practice observed in traditional families in the South, with, which do not fit or are not claimed as political acts linked to the new set of norms mentioned before. Uh, for example, someone that lives in, in a sub-Saharan African country, and uh, they actually use um, some practice to hold on water that are ecological, but they don't see themselves as doing something that is ecological. That's, that's what I wanted to, to point out here. But there may also be normative demand politicized by young people in the South. That's something that is new, linked to the sense of belonging to a collective, collective identity shared with other young people in the North. And that was the case, for example, when also in Morocco, young people inspired by the environmental activism of German youth, which is very active, organized their first, claim, uh, first climate event in Rabat in 2019. So with the genesis of a global governance on climate, the field of environmental legal standards have been extended to validate the scientific postulates on the link between the fight against global warming and health, food safety, the aesthetic protection of coastline and the protection of animals. And these rights do not apply everywhere in the world. They do not apply in the same way. So most of them, all those uh, new laws emanates from the new climate regime that is under construction and that is defined as a universalist normative regime, yet criticized for its lack of consideration of global diversity, leading to a de-differentiated and non-differentiated approach. However, global warming at the same time has the characteristic of being an issue that affects all societies whatever their culture, but whose stakes are localized and specific, which makes it a very complicated uh, topic to treat. So uh, the, the, the legislation on climate change has encouraged the emergence of new legal communities, and those legal communities are also in, in construction and are also in tension with uh, the commu uh, epistemic communities that are behind them. So, my research project aims to understand how climate change normativities contribute to the construction of new legal communities in this field uh, through the study of the normative aspect of climate change. It takes uh, into question uh, different, uh, different uh, topics such as socio-political mechanism that induce changes of norms, the way in which different normative order overlap, the links between normativity and legal community, and so on. So uh, my research is organized in three parts. The first is about dominant environmental normativities. The second is about societal and individual normative arrangements, like how from these dominant normativities in each country or each group, uh, some try to arrange to themselves something that is more fitting to their culture and so on. And third, my third part is the internormativity and legal normative wars. So internormativity is how the legal community integrates uh, norms in the, in the political sphere. So I'm, I'm now working on the first part, which is about the dominant normativities. So my question here in this part is, what are the normative claims of global climate regime? How the UN speeches in particular uh, give, um, they can have the capacity to assert themselves as true. What types of argument the UN use and does the scientific related the, to the UN use to legitimize environmentalist normativity with a universalist tendency? And the narrative maintained by these dominant epistemic communities within the sphere of global climate governance is that of the Anthropocene again, considering that we humans have in the past destroyed nature through polluting industry and overconsumption of resource uh, and uh, so that we have and continue to alter the balance of global ecosystem in a way that is dangerous for our survival. And these epistemic communities are mainly from, uh, come from industrial society, industrialist countries. 
uh, the richest countries, since they are also the ones that economically and politically dominate international institution, institution, sorry. So, so far, I found three characteristics of this main discourse. The first characteristic is that it is a discourse based on positivist morality. The second is that it is a discourse driven by universalist idealism. And the third is that it is a, a discourse that is favoring economist and quantitative response. So let me explain for the five uh, minutes that I have left. Or, uh, even, what... or even 10, Lucera. Uh, uh, Go ahead, yes, it's oh. too interesting to interrupt Thank you. you. I hope I don't speak too fast because I want no, to no, no, smash in it's 20 perfect. minutes. Okay. I hope so. Huh? So uh, the first characteristic that I found, which is the, the fact that this UN discourse is driven by universalist idealism. Uh, it, it is based on the idea of, that, of humanity taken as a whole. So in this vision, although it seems to be justified by the entry into post-bipolar globalization, because that's what we say when we want to say that we are now in universalist world and so on, we say that we are in it since the end of the Cold War, and that there was an increase of transnational inter interdependence. But nevertheless, in, in the field of political ideas, the universalist idealism is part of, as you know, an older story. So uh, think of the Enlightenment philosophers considered by, to be the forerunners of the contemporary global governance regime, like Immanuel Kant. So in his uh, book, the, the idea of universal history from a cosmopolitical point of view, he considers that the plan of nature aims at perfect civil union in the human species and develops the idea of civil society of nation. So although Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant did not invent cosmopolitis, cosmopolitanism as a political current, the duty of solidarity and mobilization today uh, that is used by UN discourse fits very well in the dis dis discursive regime. So for example, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres said lately about climate that state should not betray the human family. More generally, the universalist dimension of the fight against climate change within international institution has since the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, which is the, the first main protocol on climate change in the, in the global climate regime, been part of, of what they call a burden sharing principle, which consists on sharing the reduction in greenhouse gas emission among all the countries in the world without exception. So prior to the Kyoto Protocol, international climate negotiation only involved the richest, the most industrialized countries, because they are the stakeholders of, of these negotiations. But today, and since this protocol, all countries have become responsible for climate change somehow, even though it is known that drastic reduction in emission from industrialized countries alone would be enough to mitigate global warming on a long-term basis. So if the emphasis is placed uh, on the universalization of the struggle, it is by the way of anticipation of industrialism uh, of the South, uh, which is, for example, to prevent this country, prevent Southern countries to become, to reproduce the mistakes of the industrialized countries. So this truth regime is sometimes considered in the countries of the side, South, either as a form of ideological condensation, because the North would say, we made the mistake, we don't want you to make the same mistake because we know, or as a discursive instrument designed to maintain a systemic system of economic inequality, which tends to hinder the implementation of human recommendation because Southern country would say, but we have the right to economic growth too. So all universalism is necessarily idealistic, in my opinion. And this idealistic dimension of this environmental universalism rests in particular on the paradigm of what we call in this regime the common goods. So the common goods refer to the ecological reservoir, such as the Amazon or the Arctic. And the universalist idealism of the UN climate regimes wants to be able to protect this area for the good of humanity. But the materialistic realism that characterizes the policies of the states concerned 
prevents the introduction of any form of international legal supranationality for the preservation of a territory considered national. The, the second uh, characteristic is, uh, sorry, I was, I was talking about the, the universalist idealism. So the second characteristic is that the discourse is based on positivist morality. So the view is historically part of the industrialist approach that emerged at the beginning of the 19th century. Reference can be made to the doctrine of Saint-Simon for whom the object of industry of the, is the exploitation of the globe and that is to say, though I quote him, the appropriation of its product to the man's need, and since in accomplishing the task, it modifies the globes, transforms it, gradually change the condition of its existence. It follows that through its man participates apart from himself in the successive manifestation, and that's an important word here, of divinity. And thus, the industrialism continues the work of creation and the industry becomes the cult. So this uh, doctrine of Saint-Simon was developed by Barthélemy Prosper Enfantin, and it's called the Saint-Simonism, and it is a religious political current, as you probably know, that had an important influence on French industrialist economic thought. In the United States and in many European countries, the same circulation of ideas can be observed that promotes the technical capabilities of exploiting the environment as proof of an almost divine modernity. So the theory of the Anthropocene will be constructed in opposition to the industrialism and in the pursuit of ideologue critical of industrialism, like Eugène Huzard uh, in his book, La fin du monde par la science, which was published in 1955. And as Paul Krugzen, so the inventor of the concept of Anthropocene will start the Anthropocene era at the time of the industrial era. So uh, until the 18th century, the view uh, of future industrialized society of the environment was on the contrary one of the conservation. Fun fact, the use of fossil fuels has paradoxically been done at the beginning to protect the environment, to reduce the use of wood and protect forests. And this paradox also seems to be at the origin of a narrative that opposes an ignorant past that we had and a far-sighted present. So that today the dominant regime of idea is based on a duty such as the moral and positivist as that of the industrialism to curb climate change because we can no longer ignore uh, this meteorological knowledge uh, and its correlation with industrial activity. So the establishment of the UN and its role in identifying environmental issue and formulating recommendation uh, um, to respond to this need is focused on industries. So uh, the UN has set up an institution that uh, the IPCC, uh, that is a group of scientific experts from different disciplines to support the production of a knowledge, of a scientific knowledge, and it is the only one that made that. All the other institutions of the UN generally operates on irregular consultancy networks. And this group asserts that the importance uh, the fight climate change is also equal to fight industrialism. So the third and last characteristic, I'm so sorry I took so much time, I will try to, to be quick on that one, is a discourse favoring economist and quantitative response. In order to go beyond the limits of UN non-supranationality, uh, the UN cannot uh, you know, make the states do what they want to, them to do. So the environmentalist epistemic community represented in particular by the IPCC, that group of scientists I was talking about, have identified priority sectors and introduced quantified indicators which are supposed to enable the definition of political objective. So for example, not to exceed 1.5 degrees is a global target. In order to achieve this objective, gas reduction figures have been identified and distributed among the states in form of recommendation. And to reduce this emission, the fossil fuel industry have been targeted first 
before any other sector, before plastic, before agriculture, before forests, before oceans, and so on. So reduction emissions is nowadays an obsession of the dominant environmental regime. And this objective is approached from a quantitative rather than a qualitative perspective. It is a productivist paradigm that proposes symmetrically equally productivist and macroeconomic response. Uh, what I want to say is that because this system is productivist and, and economical uh, prioritizing thing, their response is also on the same nature. So the most illustrative example of this trend is the creation of a carbon market to quantify emissions, measure environmental protection through this indicator, introduce carbon taxes, and possibly, uh, which is a very controversial subject, be able to credit other countries with carbon rights. So the universalist introduction of quotas will therefore allow low polluting companies or low polluting countries to sell parts of their rights to pollute to other energy intensive companies. So to conclude, the dominant discursive and therefore normative uh, regime on the environment in view of the characteristic mentioned, the three characteristic, seems to be in line with the neoliberal perspective as it had been though in the theoretical field of international relations. Within this paradigm, both the problem and the solution are provided by the same epistemic community with the dominant power. Thus, while introducing a normative regime based on the knowledge of a community of scientific experts, the UN is also proposing to consider a differentiated approach and in particular to consider the challenges of climate justice. Here again, the notion of climate justice was not brought by the countries of the South as a result of a struggle of ideas, by the, by, but by the dominant uh, epistemic communities. That is what makes neoliberalism so consensual and permeable to change despite the criticism leveled at it. So one of the consequences of this dominant vision is that it is the bearer of a universal ideal aimed aimed at civilizing the world in the name of a cause considers to be just at the risk of reprodu reproducing a certain number of north-south domination mechanism through conditional funding, political or individual blame shaming. Uh, the continuation of my study will consist in clarifying this issue and truth regime within this normative power relationship between north and south by taking one or two uh, example. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Yusna, for uh, this uh, very precise and con uh, concise uh, and uh, inspiring uh, talk. Um, uh, I think you you have touched uh, a, a broad range of, of of central topics and. In, in this debate and made in the same time a proposition how to conceive them and how to have access uh, to its understanding. First of all, I think it to be remarkable to take the epistemological background as uh, a means and a strategy of building a community, a normative community. So. Uh, uh, and what you told us about uh, the characteristics uh, of this uh, specific uh, scene, uh, namely the positivist morality, universal idealism, and the uh, a pension towards quantitative methods and counting uh, of what is good for nature, what is bad for nature, independently of the local context and the natural context of yes, and differences in, in nature as such, uh, is really a challenge um, for those who are good believers and think to be in the right trend, uh, uh, one could say of an ecological uh, general global consciousness of the world and to find the appropriate norms that fit to such a common, uh, a common tool, a common interest, but as you have shown, Ha might have some implications that are in the interest and might be functionalized and mobilized in the interest of industrial, the industrial north, and uh, one could go even further. 
so that um, ecology and the ecological um, eco-argumentation, eco-semantics might be a fur further means of colonizing the world. So I heard this kind of argument in uh, the back. So we have to discuss it, uh, I think. It is important. If your suspicion would be right, we should be so reluctant with everything coming from the UNO in this context. And so much the more, I think it is very important to get a better, better knowledge of the perspective of somebody who sees it also from the eyes of Morocco, for example, and uh, merely closer to the South uh, as such. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to open the discussion. We have 15 minutes. That's a lot of time, I would say. And we start with Beatriz Barredo. Garil, good to see you. Good morning, uh, everyone. And <clears throat> congratulations. Uh, Jurva is a wonderful presentation. I enjoy very much. Um, you were mentioning um, the United Nations and the universalist approach. And I am sharing with you in the chat a link uh, because this is a call for inputs that a special rapporteur on cultural rights of United Nations, which is appointed by the Council of Human Rights. Uh, in May, she made a call for inputs uh, on the relation between climate change and uh, cultural groups. This is to say, uh, and we were listening to your uh, ideas about this uh, common family, right? That climate change is important for the whole of humanity. So I think that maybe uh, this um, uh, call and the report that it is going to be made maybe in three, four months by the special rapporteur would be a, a, as well of interest because uh, since they work with cultural rights, they work with uh, groups, communities. By the way, I was reading now this document I share with you. The word communities does not appear, but appear groups. And the worry of the special rapporteur in cultural rights is, okay, maybe there are actions, international actions for um, fighting against climate change, uh, but maybe cultural groups on the field are not consulted appropriate. There are uh, issues, right, where for uh, saving nature, so communities are expelled from the place, right, and these kind of issues. Uh, so I think it, it would be interesting as well because uh, through this new document, we are going to be able to hear uh, groups uh, whose narratives whose uh, um, ideas of what is better for fight against climate change uh, um, is, is useful. Okay, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is an important uh, hint uh, to the debate. Do you want to react or it's just a kind of information if I see right for you, sir? Okay. So uh, who want, uh, wants to intervene next and perhaps uh, uh, not in order not to forget, you were mentioning uh, Immanuel Kant. And are you familiar, Yusra, with the debate we have now in Germany? Not only because Kant was certainly, if I see, of at least of German origin, but uh, since some days only, because we have a, a constitutional debate about the role of the concept of race in Article 3 of our Constitution. And with regard to traditions, who brought legitimacy to the concept of race, or used it at least, Kant had been exactly with the article and with the, the, the text you mentioned in your talk, brought in because he is using to, and so he, with his universalistic approach, is claimed and accused by a German a professor who is now at the University of Bonn, by the way, of being one of the founding fathers of racism. This is in the international debate about race that uh, came out of the uh, rights and, uh, and it's especially the shooting in, uh, uh, of an African-American in Minnesota. Uh, so this is our 
current debate here in Germany about Kant, not because Kant was German, but because he is accused of being at the origin of such tendency. So we could discuss it, but uh, to, to bring all, uh, only this aspect dimension to uh, your uh, rightly brought into question uh, universalism, okay? Uh, comments, uh, 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 Daniel, you certainly uh, are uh, prepared for that, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Yusra, for this uh, intriguing and, and uh, fascinating presentation. Really, thank you. It's been touched upon already, but I mean, the similarities to the critical discourse on human rights is obvious, especially as we know it from the global south. And I would like to know, look for the other side. It's interesting also if you look for counter communities in both um, fields uh, in the global north, right? The, the, the arguments are, are pretty similar, I would assume. I, was, I would be interested um, to hear from you about the possible differences between these two um, global discourses. And on the other hand, what we could maybe learn from the much older and uh, much more established discourse on human rights. Thank you for this uh, really big and, and uh, very important question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, what do you mean by two dominant discourses? Because uh, from my point of view, there is uh, only one that is uh, globally accepted through the regime, which is through the UN. And the other that is opposed to that uh, dominant one is that of climate septic. Then within the, the dominant regi uh, discourse regime, that of the Anthropocene, then you have several, you know, sub theories of how to respond to the climate change. So I'm not sure I understood what you asked. Misunderstanding. I think it's a misunderstanding. I, when I say the two discourses, I mean the climate discourse on the one hand and uh, the human rights discourse on the other. Oh. Yes. Comparison. Okay, so what are your question is uh, how how all this is related uh, from my point of view, the cli the dominant climate change discourse and the human rights uh, discourse. Yeah, I think that there are uh, much a lot of similarities in uh, uh, the idealistic characteristic, the universalist characteristic, and the debates on uh, whether we should d differentiate. Uh, you know, uh, different cultures. And uh, if we take the example of women's rights, for example, uh, that's one big issue. Should, should women's rights be different because we are in an Arab region or should women's rights be the same because we are women uh, no matter what, uh, you know, cultures we come from. And that's what makes it uh, very tricky in the, in, the, in the climate change regime. It's the same thing. It is a global threat. So even though the countries do not participate to the global pollution, take a country like Kenya or Uganda, they do not pollute as such uh, when it comes to carbon emission. Uh, so, but, but that they are included in this, in this regime because one day or another, they will be maybe industrialized. And this fear of industrialization of the global south, is that what introduce like in the human rights regime, conditionality ads, you know, financing that are, you know, linked to certain way to uh, conduct the policy. I don't know if that answers your question. So for me, yeah, there is a complete parallelism that we could do. And the question would also be whether there is a chance that the climate uh, debate uh, and the specific question how universalism and how universalistic attempts relate uh, to local uh, conditions, regional ones and also cultural ones with different religious backgrounds and different justification why we should preserve nature. The reasons are uh, not the same all over the world. And uh, we also sh should and must ask whether we could mobilize those religious motives in order to reach the tool, to preserve nature. Anyway, and uh, there uh, I would like uh, at least to mention that uh, the relationship between Protestant ethics and the spirit of ecologism as it was in the center 
of the industrialized nations does make sense exactly because if Weber would be right that Protestant ethics play a role in the growth of industrial uh, be, uh, of behavior that led to industrial rationalized societies, then it might be that also the counter movement uh, may be influenced, inspired by the same attitude that is to master the world. And if the mastering of the world has led to negative results, one should also cut off those negative results by using quantitative methods, for example. So for me, it is all part of the same paradigm. But then we had to ask, what are the counter paradigms to this attitude that you rightly criticize, I think, and so how to introduce locality, local conditions, et cetera, local groupings at, and groups into that climate debate. So that, that, that is a little bit my, my question towards your approach. You are criticizing for very good reasons, I think, on the other side, what could, for example, and then I see you, you will leave as the next, next speaker, how uh, uh, would you bring, for example, experiences of Morocco into uh, the global debate? And this is not only a question of the size. The Sahara is big enough to have an influence um, <laughs> on the regional uh, and on, on the understanding of its importance. So uh, I was actually about to, to, to comment on that uh, while listening to you. I believe that the, the problem lies not in the universalist uh, ideal. Uh, as I said, human rights uh, are, should be universal because we are all human and therefore also climate change because it concerns the global earth. The problem lies in the legitimization of the discourse. And in order for the discourse and the, the responses who can and should be differentiated, be legitimate, the communities, the epistemic communities behind the discourse should represent the univer universalism, should represent diversity. But what is happening here is that in the field of human rights and again, in the field of women's rights, such as in the field of climate change, the groups of people who think the climate change, who, who actually comes with you know, discourses and, and truth uh, regimes, are not seen as legitimate person from the groups of the South. And that's where the problem lies. Uh, again, I talk about women's rights because this is something I look at a lot. In Morocco, when you have UN women, for example, that introduce a project on masculinity, but that works on that project with foreign uh, advisor, and that brings the topic to the national television, the women who will look at it and the men who are with them on the couch that day, they would say, well, those are foreign people trying to bring us new way to behave. But then you have another group of feminists in Morocco who try to combat this discourse, not because they don't agree with it, they totally agree with, with, with it, but they say that this way of doing actually go against their own efforts to bring change that is seen as legitimized because it comes from the inside. Now, this group of feminists are, not, are neither also implicated or involved on, in those global sphere. So they work separated. They work apart. And that's what is happening on the climate change regime. And, and that's, I think, where the problem lies. And that should be, the answer should be, you know, by integrating diversity into the pro uh, production of, of norms. So concerning the relationship between feminist theorizing in the Maghreb and the ecological uh, uh, thematic, uh, I, I, I I had the chance to, to talk about with a very good friend of mine, Fatima Mernissi. You might uh, know uh, her, certainly, unfortunately, she passed away, uh, but uh, uh, she was very early interested in the connection of both. 
I see Yureleko. I have a question about the new actor and the new discourse pro, uh, pro producer with, within this uh, normative complex. And here's the question, uh, what role digitalization and artificial intelligence plays in the normativization of climate as an autonomous actor or like this? That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have an answer, Yusra? I don't know much about artificial intelligence. I, I honestly, I didn't give it much thought. Uh, thoughts, but digitalization as a way to uh, use, uh, you know, tools to to be an activist has a major role. Uh, you know, I was talking in the beginning of my presentation about how youth in Morocco started to do uh, a kind of a Friday for climate uh, because they were inspired by the young German uh, in, in uh, doing the same thing. And they would have not been doing that if not for internet and digitalization of information. So I think that brought you know, uh, a, a faster diffusion, a larger diffusion of of global ideas, of transnational um, goals, uh, and that youth especially, especially youth are very um, keen and uh, very responsive to uh, their international identity and not only their national identity. So uh, they started, I noticed that in my class, like of those, those generation, they do not understand the concept of patriotism uh, related to just one country. So they like to define themselves as having an identity shared with other youth because they share with them some other norms or values and so on. And so digitalization uh, was the factor, the main factor of that, and that has, I think, a huge impact. Uh, for artificial, artificial intelligence, again, I don't have the answer, but I will look at it. Once again, for the question of the role of the digital in this context, Fatima Mernisi was, it was one of her big projects to bring digitality into the villages of Morocco. If you might remember this trend in, uh, in uh, the Maghrebinian societies uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, today, it's no longer uh, uh, a question as such, but I understand uh, but, uh, the problematic, uh, whether behind the new actors in this field, there might be also uh, those who, are, who have mm, in, uh, let me say, in the interplay and interrelation of climate change, crisis, pandemic crisis, and a third field of uh, very great and big changes that means the digital world, uh, that there is a, 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 an interconnection, interactivity uh, that we have to, de uh, to research much more precisely in the future. Thank you once more for this really very inspiring talk. It, uh, we, uh, we had a first exchange about that. We will continue that. We will uh, write your project during the time that you are our digital fellow for the moment and hopefully present the results in vivo, uh, perhaps at the end of this year or in October, November, I it would be wonderful. In any case, also uh, many thanks uh, to the others who participated and those who could not participate. And I think, for example, uh, Pierre Brunet with his question about finding new uh, categories in conceiving nature and giving it a place in our uh, yeah, cosmos of normative orders and normative dynamics in order to have really also a powerful deontic role in this debate. And I think we have to uh, mobilize all possibilities and all tools in order to get really better results.